Good morning, welcome, great to have you with us, wonderful to worship together this morning. If I can ask you if you have your Bibles to turn to Isaiah 61 please. Isaiah 61 and we will be reading verse 9 and from there we're going to go to Psalm 67, read a few verses from there as well. We're coming towards the end of our anointed series going carefully through Uh, Isaiah chapter 61, taking time to listen to the big themes prophesied about the coming of Jesus and what his ministry in the earth would look like and through his people. I'm excited for today's passage because it's painting a spectacular vision for us of what the church is in the eye of God. So that's what we're thinking about today. This is the title, Known Among the Nations known among the nations. Let's read verse nine of Isaiah 61 together. Their descendants will be known among the nations and their posterity among the peoples. All who see them will recognize that they are a people the Lord has blessed. And Psalm 67. Psalm 67, may God be gracious to us and bless us. May he make his face shine upon us so that your way may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations rejoice and shout for joy. For you judge the peoples with fairness and lead the nations on earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has produced its harvest. God our God blesses us. He will bless us and all the ends of the earth will fear him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, my prayer to you this morning is that you would present before us a vision of how you're working across the earth to gather a people before you who would radiate and shine forth the glory of your Son. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are the radiance of the glory of God. And I ask Oh, Lord, may we know your face shining upon us today. May we know the warmth of the glory of Christ upon us, melting away all iciness, that our hearts would burn with a passion for you, and that our lives would be devoted to praising and sharing the name of Jesus. What a name it is. What a beautiful name it is. And so, Lord, speak to your people today from your word and be glorified among us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I wonder if you've had a moment in your life when God put before you a vision of something and it was so beautiful and it was so captivating that it changed you forever. I mean, the gospel, when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, should be something of that order. When we see Jesus as God, and we see Jesus as the substitute for us in bearing the punishment of God for our sins, when we see Jesus dying on the cross, and and it's not just this religious moment for Christians, but it's a deeply personal moment for me where I realize all of the things that I feared and had anxiety about, all the things that that kept me up at night maybe, all my worries for the future, my fear of death. I don't need to worry about those things anymore (laughs) because he's overcome them. Because the death of Jesus Christ on the cross has overcome them. And not only that, but Jesus is alive and risen. So three days later, rose again gloriously and is today seated on a heavenly throne, reigning a glorified man who one day will return. Now, when that hits you for the first time, there should be a sense of this life-changing vision that I've seen in the depths of my heart. 
But I wonder if there's a sense of a call of God upon you that you've realized, where God's shown you something of his plans and purposes in the world and how he has chosen to use you to make a difference and to bring influence and to draw people's attention to what God is like. I wonder if you've had a moment like that where you're living differently as a, as a consequence. But the way you see other people has changed. And the gifts and talents and contexts that God has laid before you are now used for that vision, that call. When I was a teenager, I had one of those moments when I was probably around 14 years old where in the presence of God, I think it would have been in a, a if anyone knows Stonely, like the forerunner to West Point, which is the forerunner to the Commission Festival, which many of us are going to this summer. Give me a cheer if you're going to the Commission Festival. And just, just to say, what is the Commission Festival? As a church, we're joining with lots of churches from across our region of churches, our family of churches commission, in Bath for a four-day festival together where they'll be teaching worship. We as a church provide food, by the way, three meals provided every day to help. If you've not booked in, I'd urge you, please book in. Um, you can, you've gone until the end of this month. If you want to camp with us, bookings need to be made at the, by the end of the month. Right, that's a quick advert over. But I just want to say, please come. It's going to be great. And I can't wait to be with the church together. I think we've got 150 already going, so, which is wonderful. So looking forward to that. So I was at something like that, <laughs> and in the presence of God, I was hearing a vision and seeing a vision as the word of God was, was, was preached, and it was a vision for the church. And the vision was, the Lord is gathering people from every nation from every culture, from every group, every distinct group. He's gathering people, and he's going to gather people from all over the globe, and they're going to be his people, and they're going to worship him, and they're going to delight in him, and there's going to be this incredible oneness and unity. And it's a certain thing, because the Lord has promised that it's going to happen. So for me, my life changed when I got that vision. And I was like, what more would I want to give my life to than pursuing that? Now, I've not lived in another nation. That vision for me has been worked out in the context of the local church that I've been a part of, touching the nations of the world. Privilege of going and being involved in overseas mission work and supporting overseas mission work. I know many of you have been involved in overseas mission and I do believe that for some, maybe today, the Lord calls you to that. We need missionaries ready to say, do you know what, this vision is so spectacular and Jesus is so wonderful and so glorious that I just want to let people who've never heard about Jesus hear about him. That's how missionaries, that's what happens. And it's going on the confidence of this is how God has promised. This is what God has promised. And so in Isaiah 61 verse 9 we get a, a perspective on that. Let's just look at this verse together. I want us to see the construction of the phrases and particularly some peculiar nouns that are, that are used. Their descendants, who's there, is a good question. Well, in verse eight that we were looking at last week, we read, I will faithfully reward my people and make a permanent covenant with them, a permanent promise with them. Their descendants will be known among the nations their posterity, among the peoples. All who see them will recognize that they are a people the Lord has blessed. There is a promise being made here that the Lord is going to have people for himself, as it were, springing up everywhere. The nations and the peoples. That's a jarring word, isn't it, that one? People is already plural. Why do we add an S to the end of that word. It's a little jarring. But I think we'd recognize that there are nations and then there are groups within nations and there are distinct groups and there are distinct cultures and distinct people groups. And so this promise is saying every conceivable culture and group of people 
you're going to find descendants of the promise. What promise? When God spoke to a very elderly man, Genesis 17, Abraham, right at the end of his life, and he said, you've not had a child, but you're going to have a son. And from him will come the nations. Look at the stars. Look at the sand. I'm going to have a people for myself from the nations. Now, when we often think about, I think this would be true for all of us. It is true for me. When I think about the gospel, almost always I'm thinking about it in terms of its impact on my life. So when I think about the good news of Jesus Christ, I'm thinking because of, the, because of Jesus, my sins are forgiven and I have eternal life with God. And I love the gospel because it's made that kind of change to me. But it's quite an individualistic perspective on the gospel which as we read through the Bible, we actually find the Lord God has a vision which is vast for what the gospel is achieving. And, and for you and I, if we're, to get, if we're to plunder the riches of what Christ has done, then the Lord needs to help lift our perspective really highly, like an eagle soaring, so that we see above the context even of our own lives, above even the context of our own church, above even the context of our own city and our own nation, to get a, a view of the work of God across the world, across the ages, to be drawing, it says here, a people. So from the peoples and from the nations will be seen a people. So we've got the plural, peoples, and then we have the singular, a people. That this is a united, gathered people for God. And this is the vision that Isaiah is seeing in this moment. My people will be recognized. They will be seen. The people of the world will notice them. They will see them. They will be distinct. They will be recognized. In 2 Corinthians 3, the Apostle Paul writing to the church in Corinth, he says to them, do you know that you're a letter to be read by all? What does the Lord read in us? What does the letter say? What does the letter of Hope Church read like? What does the letter of the church in our nation and in the nations, what does it read like? So if we're to be recognized, what are we being recognized for? Is a good question for us to ask. Well, here it's saying that can be recognized as a people blessed. That's how the nations were, a people who are blessed. So what what it's not saying here is from the nations and from the peoples will come the denominations will come the Protestants, the Baptists, the Charismatics, the Evangelicals, the Catholics, will come the Presbyterians, and you add any other denomination you you, you might have in mind. From the nations, from the peoples, will come a people. So what this does invariably cause us to think about is, why does the church seem to be so divided? Why does, it, why, does it, why does the church appear to be so different? Why, why is it that there are so many different streams and denominations and churches? Have you ever wondered that? I can tell you, people who aren't Christians yet wonder about that. Why are you so divided? Why are there so many of you? What kind of church are you? Now, legitimately, we should ask, in light of all that's been said and prophesied here, why is it like that? Is it okay that it's like that? Well, Jesus said it would be. Okay, well, that's comforting. (laughs) Jesus said that among the, the wheat will be weeds. Jesus said that even within the church, there's going to be a mix. There will be those who claim to be Christians who aren't. And even in the early church, among faithful Christians, there were disagreements and challenges. And divisions and disputes are always tragic in the church. And a church that is divided is a church that makes a very poor 
witness to the world around us. And I think we need to hold our hands up. Let, well, I'm holding my hands up and saying, oh, we've not done really very well in this area. So whilst as a, as a young boy, I had this vision of some a beautiful people from every nation, tribe, and tongue, I knew what it was like to be a bit tribal. I knew what it was like to think that my church is better than their church. I, I would have said, we're, we're a much better church, you should come to us. Shocking. But there might be legitimate reasons why I would say to somebody, you shouldn't go there, you should come here. So, when it comes to challenges of division and difference, we just need to take it very carefully and seriously. On the one hand, we shouldn't diminish it or, or, or kind of pretend like it doesn't exist. And yet, on the other hand, we shouldn't let that reality kill us as well. So, I want to turn to Ephesians 4, which my wonderful friend Steve Chick read to us earlier. Because that's the passage that I'd like us to think about in light of this. So there are, there are differences, there are divisions. So what is the nature of unity that we should be looking for? Because we should be looking for it. Because the Lord is calling us to it. So Ephesians 4, verse 1. Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, urge you to live worthy of the calling you've received with all humility and gentleness and patience bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. I just want to stop there. The letter to the Corinthians was written to a church, like we are, a local church. The letter to the Ephesians was written to many churches. So when we read this verse, we need to understand that the primary context that this is being written into is many churches. So like the letter to the churches in Winchester would come to us, would come to Christ Church, would come to Vineyard Churches, and we could, the Baptist Church, it would come to all of us, right? And so we read in light of that, hey guys, with all humility and gentleness and patience, bear with one another in love. making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Immediately that's challenging. And it's very, very, but it's challenging because we go, we do really need to love one another. And here's the appeal, and here's the qualification for why he's writing these things. Because there is one body. There is one spirit, just as you are called to one hope at your calling. There is one Lord and one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in all. So we're united here around truth. So unity comes initially, firstly I'm saying here, through truth, through the gospel, through faith. And our gospel, the true gospel, is the gospel of all Christians and of all confessing, uh, Christians who confess Jesus Christ as God and as the one who's conquered sin and death, who truly died and was truly resurrected. So wherever that gospel is, we find brothers and sisters united together in one faith, by one spirit, into one body. So we praise God for the expressions of his body in this city, which includes different styles, different ways perhaps of worshipping. We would be a little more contemporary, maybe. Others would be a little more formal. But those are certainly not reasons for division. But it's amazing how quickly Christians can make them reasons for division. And we should be fighting and pursuing unity all the time. Pursue unity. But it's interesting how we seem to be quicker to pursue divisions. Because there is an enemy who comes to kill and destroy and steal 
But Jesus has come that we might have life and have it in abundance. Verse 15 of Ephesians 4. But speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into him who is the head, Christ. From him the whole body fitted and knitted together by every supporting ligament promotes the growth of the body for building up itself in love by the proper working of each individual part, again in the context of the wider church. Speaking the truth in love. So unity doesn't come at the expense of truth, and truth doesn't come at the expense of love. You, if, you can't just have truth, truth, truth. What do you believe? What's your doctrine? But no love for for those people that you're talking to. And on the other hand, if you're saying, hey, hey man, it's just love. Just love one another. It doesn't matter what they teach about the gospel. It's just about love. And Paul's saying, no, no, there's one Lord, there is one baptism, there is one faith, there is one spirit. So the unity that the Lord is pursuing for his people is a unity built around these two foundational aspects. United in truth, united in love. Now, there are primary truths which the church unites around, the gospel. So if someone is preaching that there is no resurrection from the dead, that's another gospel. You know, Paul says that. That's another gospel. So if a church is, if, if a church is saying, we, we don't actually believe that Jesus really rose from the, from the dead, what's our obligation and duty? Well, I'd say firstly, it's to say, hey, I just think you need to stop saying that. Let's have a conversation. Like to extend a brotherly arm and say, hey, I love you. That's not the gospel. The first thing is not to say, hey, you guys, leave that church and come here. I'd say that the first thing we're looking to do is to confront sin where we see it. That's sin. If a, if a, If I preach to you another gospel, the the, the Apostle Paul says, even if I preach to you another gospel, let me be accursed. If I preach to you a gospel other than Christ and him crucified and him raised from the dead, let me be accursed, the Apostle Paul said. That is our, that's the life-giving message. But if that message continues to be preached we have to recognize that the evil one has come in and is preaching a false message and a false gospel unity in truth and unity in love and and the wonderful thing about what's happening in this moment in the history of this church in Ephesus is that doing really well with this so in Ephesians 1 right at the beginning in verse 15 it says this is why Since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, truth, and your love for all the saints, love, I never stop giving thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. So so the barometer for the Apostle Paul for how well a church is doing and how well the churches in Ephesus are doing is their faith in Christ and their love for one another. That's amazing. So he doesn't write... When I heard that your giving had gone up by 20%, or when I heard that your attendance had rocketed, I was thanking God. He said, no, when I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and your love for all the saints, wow, at that point, I praised God. By this, they will know that you are my disciples, that you love one another. And in a world which is as hostile as this one is, where there are so many divisions between people, divisions caused by disparity of wealth or disparity of education, divisions on the grounds of racism, divisions on the grounds of politics. I mean, we're so good at finding reasons to be divided from one another. We are like PhD level, all of us, at at finding reasons to be divided from one another. But the ministry of the gospel, the Apostle Paul says, is a ministry of reconciliation. That's what we are having worked among, among us. And it's not just reconciliation within your local church. 
So, if you're, so on the one hand, if you're like, hey, I'm, I'm so well-knit in my local church, but yet you're, 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 you're speaking harshly and you're undermining other Christians and other churches, then you're propagating division. So this, this challenge comes here and your love for, it's all the saints. So that means that we pray and love the other churches in our location and in our nation and around the nations of the world. So if the Anglican church is really struggling, we don't go, oh, that's them, this is us. No, that, that's us, that's the church. Let's pray for the church. In the same way that they will, I hope, pray for us when we struggle and when we have and when we will. We need one another. We're a body. We're committed to this. Amen? Amen. It's crucial for the health and for the witness of God's people. Okay, as I begin to wind up, let's just go back to Isaiah 61. And the question is, what does it look like to be blessed? So when it says right at the end, a people will be recognized by the Lord as blessed, what, what does that look like? What are people seeing? Now, I know I've said unity is a, is a big one, but there's something even more, I think, spectacular that the Lord's wanting to, to happen among his people. And to show you what that is, I want you to just turn back a page to Isaiah chapter 60. Listen to this. This is stunning vision for the church. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord shines over you. For look, darkness will cover the earth, and total darkness the people. Let's just stop there. We're not to pretend like everything's rosy when it isn't. Look, look, guys, darkness will cover the peoples. And we, we are very aware of, of the darkness that's covering the peoples of the world. Of course we are. Just turn the news on any moment in time. We're fed constantly the worst of what's happening in the world. Now, most of the time, people are just getting on with their lives but we're told about the worst and the darkest, and we know that there's dark stuff happening. But listen to this. But the Lord will shine over you, and his glory will appear over you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to your shining brightness. Wow. Raise your eyes and look around. They will gather and come to you. Your sons will come from far away, and your daughters on the hips of nannies. Then you will see and be radiant, and your heart will tremble and rejoice because the riches of the sea will become yours and the wealth of the nations will come to you. That's the vision for the church. That's the vision that got me when I was 14. I want us as a church to have that kind of big picture vision that we would be a people who radiate. How do we radiate? Well, the glory of the Lord has shone upon us. In Psalm 67 that we read earlier, may your face shine upon us. What is that? It's Jesus Christ, who is the radiance of the glory of God. He shines on his people. He is the light of the world. And the light has overcome the darkness. And Jesus Christ is overcoming the darkness in our world. Look, darkness reigns, but... His light will shine over. His glory will overcome it. It's a promise, and we've been hearing repeatedly through today. Hear it again. The Lord does not lie. He's faithful to his promise. He will do it. There's coming a day when the glory of God melts away all darkness, and his light shines so brilliantly and brightly that any sin left in me or in any people group will melt away before him as he beautifies and perfects his church to be the radiant, spotless bride that he has determined to have and is going to have. Praise God.
Raise your eyes. Look, I had the privilege, Lizzie and I, in October, we went to Cyprus to join with leaders from around the world. I've mentioned it before. But we heard of people coming to know Jesus at a remarkable rate in some remarkable countries. China, Pakistan, across South America, India, Iraq. People coming to realize Jesus is God. And Jesus is compassionate and merciful and gracious and kind. And, and, and the light of his love is greater than the darkness of hatred. People coming to faith in Jesus. Look, let me assure you, it's happening around the globe today. The rate of people coming to faith in Jesus Christ in China is reported to be around 25 to 30,000 a day. Believe that. Our churches that we're in relationship directly with in India, in the last five years, have gone from 60 churches to 200, no, 300 now. And there's a clear plan in place for 1,000 churches by 2030. And they are planting into Bangladesh and into Indonesia. It's, a, it's happening. It can be very easy for us to get downcast and just look at the darkness. But let me tell you, the Lord is on the move and he is saving men, women and children around the world. It's happening. Yeah. And it's happening in our church. And we as a church are richer and wealthier for every single person who comes here from another people, group, and nation. And it's been amazing how that's been something that God, by his grace, has been doing. How we as a church in a place like Winchester are increasingly finding we're multiracial, we're multicultural, we're multiethnic. And it's wonderful. What are we doing that's really clever? Nothing really at all. It's a, it's a blessing. What are we doing? I think we're preaching Jesus. We're worshiping Jesus. We're keeping the gospel centric. We're not parting with the Bible and with the word of God. We're putting our confidence here, not in any man, not in any woman, not in any of the outstanding things that are done, our brilliant kids work, our wonderful musicians. Our confidence isn't in those things. Our confidence rests in the message of the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. And as we preach that, so the nations will be drawn to us. And Jesus said, if I am lifted up, I will draw all people unto myself. What is the lifting up? It's the cross. It's the narrow way through which the peoples of the world come and through which the glory of Christ shines so that we become radiant, blessed, seen as blessed. It was said of the disciples by the Pharisees and the scribes, they've been with Jesus. <laughs> oh, I want that to be said of me and of us. They've been with Jesus. So let's read finally, and I'm gonna sign off just by reading this text, Revelation 7. 9 to 10. This is what it looks like in the end. If the band can come up. After this, I looked, and there was a vast multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language, which no one could number, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. And they were clothed in white robes and palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels stood around the throne and along with the elders and the four living creatures they fell face down before the throne and worshipped God saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Why don't we stand together. Lord, we thank you for this spectacular vision that you have portrayed before us in your word. A people from the peoples, from the nations, 
every single one saved by the blood of the Lamb. And we thank you that same Lamb is the Lion of Judah who roars over the nations. And the nations, Lord, are your inheritance. And so we say, gather your inheritance, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus, the Spirit and the Bride, say come. Lord, we say hasten the day when you return, when every single people group will be represented before you. We live for that day and we commit ourselves to obediently going, making disciples of all nations, first here and to the ends of the earth. We love you and we glorify you together. Amen.